Thank you, Mr. Davis, for your kindness and consideration. Please don't think it's funny when you want the ones you miss. There are lots and lots of people who sometimes feel like this. Mr. Speaker, I borrowed that opening verse from one of the original songs written by Fred McFeely Rogers during his long and legendary career. He wrote over 200 such songs to help explain complex, confusing, and often frightening issues to children in a gentle, non-condescending, and reassuring manner. And that is what Mr. Rogers did best, make generations of children in this nation and beyond feel special, important, and most of all, loved. Mr. Rogers always started his show by changing into his familiar cardigan and comfy tennis shoes to give children a sense of comfort and consistency. As I don this cardigan, I know there are lots and lots of people in this chamber and the world who will forever miss the neighborly comfort, love, and wisdom Mr. Rogers gave while wearing a sweater like this one on the show. It is in his honor that I have introduced House Resolution 111, and I sincerely hope all my colleagues join with me in celebrating the legacy of Fred Rogers. Fred was born in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, about a half hour east of Pittsburgh, and lived nearly his entire life in the city I am proud to represent, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh will always be Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It was in Pittsburgh in 1954 that Mr. Rogers began, began his lifelong involvement with children's television, co-producing a seven-year run of the Children's Corner, which at the time was broadcast on the nation's first community-sponsored educational television station, WQED in Pittsburgh. In addition to his duties as producer, Mr. Rogers also performed musical numbers for the show and manipulated the puppets. Such famous puppets as Daniel Striped Tiger, King Friday the 13th, and Henrietta Pussycat from his show went on to live in what is perhaps the most famous neighborhood in the world, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. From his early and humble start in February of 1968, Mr. Roger and all of his neighbors have the distinction of being the longest running program ever on PBS with nearly 900 episodes and 33 seasons to their credit. Although not comfortable in the spotlight, Mr. Rogers nevertheless has received much well-deserved recognition for his efforts, including the distinction as being one of TV Guide's 50 greatest TV stars of all time, four Emmys, and induction to the Television Hall of Fame. His messages of self-worth, respect, and understanding have long served as a calm refuge and important contrast in a world of children's television filled with frenetically paced and often violent cartoons. And my friends, we have had more than our share of destruction, violence, and fear in these uncertain times. World events play out very differently in the eyes of a child and in our rush to give voice to our own personal opinions on the happenings of the day. It's sometimes we overlook the importance of taking the time to explain issues to our children in a calm and easy manner and thus help ease the trepidations of a child growing up in today's world. Fred Rogers realized the importance of taking the time to communicate with children, a fact that was at the very heart of his goals and beliefs. Although he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, he never preached to his audience, but then again, he never had to. His message of unconditional love, peace, self-respect, and respect for one's neighbor is universal. He once said, when you're helping children feel safe, you're helping them use their energies for moving forward toward a more hopeful future for themselves and for our society. Mr. Rogers helped children confront difficult, real-world issues such as divorce, disease, and adoption by listening to them and engaging them on these topics by talking to them in a manner that respected a child's developing intellect. I truly hope that the important messages that Mr. Rogers shared with us and our children continue on for the next generation of future congressmen and women. And I am confident that his legacy will continue 
as I have heard that PBS is encouraging all local PBS stations to continue running the rebroadcast of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. His legacy will also continue in the works of the nonprofit organization founded by Mr. Rogers, Family Communications Incorporated of Pittsburgh. In the words of Mr. Bill Eisler, President of Family Communications, Mr. Rogers was a composer, minister, author, puppeteer, brother, husband, father, grandfather, and a friend to every child and the entire human family. Those of us who worked with Fred Rogers share both the privilege and the responsibility of continuing his work so that no child anywhere grows up without being told, you are special. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I want to leave you with something that Mr. Rogers once said in regards to helping children understand and cope with terrible news events on television. He said, when I was a boy and would see scary things on the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You always find people who are helping. To this day, that is where I focus my attention, to the many caring people in this world. Where our world lost one of the greatest and most caring helpers when Mr. Rogers was called home. But his teachings and messages have instilled in us the responsibility, the duty, the ability to carry on his legacy by being one of the helpers that our children look for and need. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. We will always miss your special caring way of helping and comforting us all. You will always be for the children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fred Rogers' first appearance on C-SPAN was in 1999. Fred Rogers' first appearance on C-SPAN was a 1990 speech at the National Press Club. He discussed the importance of children's television well, thank you very during much. this half-hour event. It's a treat to be with so many good friends. It seems like uh, 35 years has gone very quickly. There are times when it didn't seem that it went that quickly. <laughs> but hearing that, uh, hearing all that uh, it has meant to people, and that's what's so wonderfully satisfying about this work, to have people come up and say to you, do you know what it's meant to us in our lives to be able to visit with you? Well, it's really marvelous, and I, I'd like to say, Good afternoon, and I'd like to say guten tag. Is that right? Is that what? Yeah. And you taught me to say wie heißt du? Was, was that what you taught me? Could I ask you wie heißt du? Could you tell me? Yeah. yeah. Could you tell me what your names are? Those of you who are, are from Germany? Yeah, all together. <laughs> It sounds like a very nice song when everyone says his or her name together. Would you do it? Be high stew. Very good, thank you. And what is your name? Please. All together. Okay, thank you. I'm going to show the children some puppets after we have this adult speech. But right now, this is something that I have prepared for the grown-ups. There are many reasons I feel special about being in Washington. For one, my great-grandmother lived here. And I remember the first 10 years of my life visiting her, four generations together. She taught me to like cooked spinach. In fact, I had some this morning and I thought of it. <laughs> she says, all you have to do is doctor it up a little bit. You'll see. And she taught me to take a long time to drink a glass of milk. One of her granddaughters is here today. Do you remember that? She said, take a long time to drink a glass of milk. Nana Given. It doesn't sit well if you swill it down, she said. And she was healthy, living proof of what she taught. She never discussed her age. If anybody ever asked her how old she was, she would say 68. 
She said that even when her own daughter was 68. <laughs> but the records show that she lived to be over 100, and I know for a fact that she was reading the daily newspaper without her glasses the day before she died. That was 50 years ago. Nevertheless, you know feelings about places, as well as feelings about practically everything else, get started long ago in each of our lives. Anyway, the excitement of visiting an interesting great-grandmother certainly spilled over into all the times I've come to Washington in my adult life. I remember when I was in my 30s, and I was invited to come here and testify before Senator Pastore and his committee re requesting government support for the fledgling educational television stations. John Pastore. I was scared. By the time it came for me to speak, it was late in the day, and I could tell that the whole committee, including Senator Pastore, had already heard enough from those who had testified before me. So even though I had a prepared statement, I set it aside and told our story as quickly as I could. I'd like you to see the last couple minutes of that Washington occasion. Only make it clear that feeling are mentionable and manageable. We will have done a great service for mental health. Uh, I think that it's much more dramatic that two men could be working out their feelings of anger, much more dramatic than showing something of gunfire. I'm constantly concerned about what our children are seeing. And for 15 years, I have tried in this country and Canada to present what I feel is a meaningful expression of care. Do you I, narrate it? I'm the host, yes. And I do all the puppets, and I write all the music, and I write all the scripts. Well, I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. <laughs> well, I'm grateful, not only for your goosebumps, but for your interest in in our kind of communication. Could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do doing puppets in in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad you could bite. When the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, stop, stop any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady, and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. <coughs> Looks like you just earned the $20 million. <laughs> <laughs> It was a mighty special time. And that is a good feeling when you feel that you are in control of what's going on inside of you. I talked with a group of students from American University yesterday, 
and they're just near the end of their adolescence. And they know what it's like to have all of that turmoil going on inside of them. And they responded so lovingly to those of us who supported them by saying, congratulations on who you are becoming, because you are getting control of what's inside of you, and that is a good feeling. Well, after that day, Senator Pastore and I corresponded for years, and I learned a lot from him. His father had died when John was a teenager, and John had to go to work to help sustain his mother and his younger siblings. He had always wanted to be a medical doctor, but he realized that he couldn't do that by going to night school. But he could study law at night and work all day, and so he did. He put himself through college and law school and helped the rest of his family as well. But his love for medicine didn't fade away. John Pastore got married and had three children and became the senator from Rhode Island for many years. His three children grew up. One became a doctor, one became a nurse, and the third one married a doctor. <laughs> All kinds of attitudes flow from generation to generation. I remember years ago coming to the White House to watch Lyndon Johnson sign the Act for Public Television. In fact, I understand that there's a 25th reunion of everyone who worked at that administration going on in Washington today. Of course, we've come to Washington to tape scenes for the neighborhood. We've taped at the zoo and the place where people make postage stamps. And we've presented one of my zipper sweaters to the Smithsonian <laughs> Institution. And not too long ago, we were invited to the Soviet Embassy to celebrate the first exchange between Soviet and American children's television programs. I had gone to Moscow to be on Tatyana Vedneva's Spikone Nochi Malashi program, and she had come here, she had just arrived here, as a matter of fact, to be on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. At the embassy, we showed some of the Moscow studio visit, and I'd like you to see a few minutes of that now. Uh, 
it was Felicity who called that uh, puppet detente. <laughs> there were many people at the Russian embassy the day we visited. Many children as well as adults. And one of the newspaper people told me that such crowds in there were practically unheard of. Nevertheless, the ambassador and his wife seemed very relaxed and having quite a good time. On the other hand, I was being pulled in all directions. People were asking Tatiana and me all kinds of questions. This was just before that great openness in the Soviet Union. Of course, I didn't know that such a major revolution was about to begin. Well, one reason I tell you all of this is that there was a columnist from a large newspaper who obviously had tried to get more of my time than I was able to give. I was so caught up in the interaction with our Soviet counterparts that this columnist misinterpreted my involvement, and as he wrote about that day, he called the whole affair a photo opportunity. When I read the clipping that someone sent me, I was reminded again that the basis of any healthy communication is listening, as well as having the time to be able to be yourself. Reporters have jobs to do, to get their stories to their papers on time. But reporters aren't machines. They're human beings who have their own inner stories. In fact, Every story that they report is filtered through their own life experience, no matter how objective they may be. And that's good. It's good that communicators are not machines. I still wish that I hadn't been so distracted that day and had been able to be more aware of the needs of that columnist more present to his moment. Not so much because of what he wrote, but because as the years go on, I want to be the best possible listener I can be. I want to be as far removed from being a machine as possible. Well, television's a machine, but those of us who appear on it must not be. As adroit as some television hosts and hostesses are at welcoming, interviewing, and saying goodbye to a guest in three minutes or less, I lament what existentially is communicated during such an interview. Whether we mass communicators intend it or not, we provide models for other people's communications. Picture and sound bites are not what I've ever wanted to communicate to anybody. There's nothing more fascinating for a human being to witness than the unfolding of a relationship between two persons. When that can happen in real life, or in any kind of dramatic representation, it's very natural for us to be interested. Do you know why? 
Do you know why a two-year-old is fascinated with mud or water play? Do you know why a five-year-old might want to build a tall block building or act like a bride in a pretend wedding? I believe it's the same reason you and I are fascinated with the drama of two people developing a relationship. It's that at different ages, we human beings are working on different life tasks. Two-year-olds are working on control of their body fluids. Five-year-olds are working on some understanding of what it means to be a boy or a girl, of what daddies are like what mummies are like. And in our adult years, we are working on how to be in relationship to those around us. So, listening and trying to understand the needs of those we would communicate with seems to me to be the essential prerequisite of any real communication and we might as well aim for real communication. One more association about Washington, D.C. Over 10 years ago, a mother and a father and a five-year-old boy were sitting quite close to me as I had breakfast at that Howard Johnson's across from the Watergate. They smiled and waved, and I smiled and said, are you some of our television neighbors? When they nodded, I went over to their table to meet them. Well, that was the beginning of a long relationship. That little boy, Jeff Erlinger, had multiple handicaps, but not a lack of confidence. Mr. and Mrs. Erlinger had obviously treated him with such affection and respect that he radiated his own special kind of sunshine. We had a good visit that morning, talking about the neighborhood characters and the sites the Erlingers were planning to visit in Washington. They had come from Wisconsin to show Jeff this wonderful city. Every year after that, Jeff's mom and dad sent progress reports, how he was doing in school, what new personal tasks he had been able to accomplish. And when he was about 11, they wrote to say that Jeff had gotten a new electric wheelchair. Well, I had been thinking about showing a wheelchair on the neighborhood for some time. I wanted children who used such chairs to feel represented in our television community. And I wanted children who didn't use those chairs to come to view them as something acceptable and respectable. So I called and asked if the Erlingers would consider coming to Pittsburgh and having Jeff demonstrate his special chair right on the television program. They accepted the invitation, and when they came to the studio, it was a great reunion. Six years had passed since we had been together. And after our original greetings, I asked our television director to forego any rehearsal and simply tape Jeff's visit. All I told Jeff was that I would like him to show the children how he was able to work his chair. And also, I'd like us to sing his favorite neighborhood song together. In his usual way, he said, sure. And pretty soon, we had started. I'd like you to see that time that we had together. It's a very fancy machine, but, you, but you're the one who makes it go. Right. Did it take a long time to learn how? No, not really. I had other wheelchairs, and that only took... My first electric wheelchair only took me about a day to learn how to use it. Gee, that's wonderful. Jeff, you, your mom and dad must be really proud of you. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Well, I know I am. Now, uh, can you tell my friends what it is that made you need this wheelchair? Sure. 
Well, when I was about seven months old, I had um, I had a tumor, and it broke the nerves to tell my hands and legs what to do. I see. And they tried to cut the tumor, but they they couldn't get it, and I became handicapped. And I got a wheelchair when I was four years old. That was your first one? Mm-hmm. When you were four? Uh-huh. Do you remember that? Yeah, sort of. You must have some mighty good doctors who've been taking care uh-huh. of you. Uh-huh. Can you tell me any of your doctor's names? Yeah, I have a pediatrician, Dr. Hansen, who works in Madison St. Mary's Hospital. And then at UW, I have the bone doctor, is Dr. Breed, who takes care of the bones, I guess, because he's a bone yeah. doctor. Uh-huh. Anyway, I had surgery earlier this summer because I have pain in my s- stomach called autonomic dysreflexia. And I Wh- just... What was that Autonomic word? dysreflexia. I'm not exactly sure what it means. But you sure can say it. Yeah. Anyway, so I had a surgery done just recently mm-hmm. to try and cut the sphincter because of holding my urine in. Mm-hmm. So, well, you have a lot of things going on when you're... This just shows you have a lot of things happening to you when you're handicapped so most of the time. But, and uh, sometimes it happens when you're not handicapped. Of course. But you're able to talk about those things. Yeah. So well and help other people. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh who might have the same kinds of things. Uh-huh. Uh, do you know that song that I sometimes sing called It's You I Like? Uh-huh. I'd like to sing that to you and with you. Okay, okay? sure. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. The way you are right now, the way down deep inside you, not the things that hide you, not your fancy chair, (laughs) that's just beside you, but it's you I like, every part of you, your skin, your eyes. Your feeling, whether old or new. I hope that you remember, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like, it's you yourself, it's you. And there must be times when you do feel blue. Uh-huh. What do you do th- during those times? Well, it depends. Sometimes do you make up stories? Yeah. Or read? Yeah. Or play? I know that's the way I did when I was a little boy. Had all kinds of things that did I would Did it help? Do. It did help. Yeah. Does it help you? Yeah. We have to all discover our own ways, don't we? Mm-hmm. Of doing things when we're feeling blue. Mm-hmm. I'm not feeling blue right now, though. Me neither. <laughs> I'm so glad that you came today. Thanks. Thank you. And I hope you'll come back to visit again. Okay. Will you? Yeah. And will you give your mom and dad my best? Sure. Because they are sure great people. Uh-huh. Bye. Bye-bye, Jeff. I'll watch you as you go. You know, 
I've always felt that uh, that feelings that are mentionable are so much more manageable. And I think that's what we try to do with the neighborhood is to to help make feelings mentionable. Well, last year, Jeff graduated from high school and now he's enrolled in an independent living dorm at a local college. He never ceases to inspire me. I feel I've been greatly blessed by many people I've been able to meet and come to know. Some of you are in this room. Sure, I've worked hard. You don't choose a job in communications and expect not to work hard. But you can expect that you don't have to do it alone. To me, that's what communications is all about. Nobody should have to do it alone. And communications is communing in a community where people listen to themselves and others, where they try to understand what they've heard, and then respond to, with all the creativity and care that their life has allowed them to develop. I certainly wish you all well in all that you do, and thank you for your warm welcome today. universal. He once said, when you're helping children feel safe, you're helping them use their energies for moving forward toward a more hopeful future for themselves and for our society. Mr. Rogers helped children confront difficult real-world issues such as divorce, disease, and adoption by listening to them and engaging them on these topics by talking to them in a manner that respected a child's developing intellect. I truly hope that the important messages that Mr. Rogers shared with us and our children continue on for the next generation of future congressmen and women. And I am confident that his legacy will continue, as I have heard that PBS is encouraging all local PBS stations to continue running the rebroadcast of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. His legacy will also continue in the works of the nonprofit organization founded by Mr. Rogers, Family Communications Incorporated of Pittsburgh. In the words of Mr. Bill Eisler, President of Family Communications, Mr. Rogers was a composer, minister, author, puppeteer, brother, husband, father, grandfather, and a friend to every child and the entire human family. Those of us who worked with Fred Rogers share both the privilege and the responsibility, and I sincerely hope all my colleagues join with me in celebrating the legacy of Fred Rogers. Fred was born in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, about a half hour east of Pittsburgh, and lived nearly his entire life in the city I am proud to represent, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh will always be Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It was in Pittsburgh in 1954 that Mr. Rogers began, began his lifelong involvement with children's television, co-producing a seven-year run of the Children's Corner, which at the time was broadcast on the nation's first community-sponsored educational television station, WQED in Pittsburgh. In addition to his duties as producer, Mr. Rogers also performed musical numbers for the show and manipulated the puppets. Such famous puppets as Daniel Striped Tiger King Friday the 13th and Henrietta Pussycat from his show went on to live in what is perhaps the most famous neighborhood in the world, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. From his early and humble start in February of 1968, Mr. Roger and all of his neighbors have the distinction of being the longest running program ever on PBS with nearly 900 episodes and 33 seasons to their credit. Although not comfortable in the spotlight, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for your kindness and consideration. Please don't think it's funny when you want the ones you miss. There are lots and lots of people
who sometimes feel like this. Mr. Speaker, I borrowed that opening verse from one of the original songs written by Fred McFeely Rogers during his long and legendary career. He wrote over 200 such songs to help explain complex, confusing, and often frightening issues to children in a gentle, non-condescending, and reassuring manner. And that is what Mr. Rogers did best, make generations of children in this nation and beyond feel special, important, and most of all, loved. Mr. Rogers always started his show by changing into his familiar cardigan and comfy tennis shoes to give children a sense of comfort and consistency. As I don this cardigan, I know there are lots and lots of people in this chamber and the world who will forever miss the neighborly comfort, love, and wisdom Mr. Rogers gave while wearing a sweater like this one on the show. It is in his honor that I have introduced House Resolution 111 of continuing his work so that no child anywhere grows up without being told, you are special. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I want to leave you with something that Mr. Rogers once said in regards to helping children understand and cope with terrible news events on television. He said, when I was a boy and would see scary things on the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You always find people who are helping. To this day, that is where I focus my attention, to the many caring people in this world. Where our world lost one of the greatest and most caring helpers when Mr. Rogers was called home. But his teachings and messages have instilled in us the responsibility, the duty, the ability to carry on his legacy by being one of the helpers that our children look for and need. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. We will always miss your special caring way of helping and comforting us all. You will always be for the children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fred Rogers' first appearance on C-SPAN was in 1999. Fred Rogers' first appearance on C-SPAN was a 1990 speech at the National Press Club. He discussed the importance of children's television well, thank you very much. during this half hour. Mr. Rogers, nevertheless, has received much well-deserved recognition for his efforts, including the distinction as being one of TV Guide's 50 greatest TV stars of all time, four Emmys, and induction to the Television Hall of Fame. His messages of self-worth, respect, and understanding have long served as a calm refuge, an important contrast in a world of children's television filled with frenetically paced and often violent cartoons. And my friends, we have had more than our share of destruction, violence, and fear in these uncertain times. World events play out very differently in the eyes of a child and in our rush to give voice to our own personal opinions on the happenings of the day. It's sometimes we overlook the importance of taking the time to explain issues to our children in a calm and easy manner, and thus help ease the trepidations of a child growing up in today's world. Fred Rogers realized the importance of taking the time to communicate with children, a fact that was at the very heart of his goals and beliefs. Although he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, he never preached to his audience, but then again, he never had to. His message of unconditional love, peace, self-respect, and respect for one's neighbor 